we finally have a complete screen adaptation of Frank Herbert's first Dune book. As a movie, it gives most viewers what they want. Action, romance, great visuals, even humour. For many, this movie is a masterpiece. For others, it's simply a good film, and a worthy successor to its predecessor, The Dune Part 1. And of course there are people that didn't like the movie at all. I'd like to start off by saying that everyone who worked on this film brought their A-game, whether it be cast or crew, and you can clearly see the love, care and passion the cast and crew have for this project. The standouts in this movie are the cinematography, performances, costumes and script, categorising those kind of in order of strength, and I agree with most of the positive reviews about this film and also some of the criticisms being made about the film, but I'll get to those later. I'm going to call it a sequel because that's what it feels like, it's the wedge between two other films. While it might be called part two, it's part two of three, and not merely part two of two, even though it might be marketed that way. The strongest element of this film, I would say, is definitely the Bene Gesserit, which was a conscious decision by Denis Villeneuve, early on, to focus on that faction. It will also help the Dune Prophecy series when it's released, which seems to be loosely based on the Sisterhood of Dune book. So what was my favourite thing about this movie? And who really stole the show for me? I think it will surprise some people. It's going to have to be Rebecca Ferguson's portrayal as Lady Jessica or the Reverend Mother Jessica. What a fantastic performance by Rebecca Ferguson. And the reason I like it so much is because I always kind of saw Jessica as a villain, not in the traditional Dune book sense of course because there are really no heroes and villains as such, but I always saw her actions as being the root cause of all of these problems that occur in the Dune universe a ripple effect that causes destruction and devastation. And some of her actions are really questionable, which is exactly what you want in a character that isn't quite a hero or a villain. Of course that's going to ring true for Paul Atreides later, and indeed he begins to go down that road in the Dune Part 2 movie itself. But the way in which Jessica manipulates the Fremen into doing her bidding and everything she wants done so that her son can ascend to this level of status among them in terms of being a Mehdi to the Fremen or the Lisan al Ghaib, and her becoming the Reverend Mother of the Fremen. Her character felt the most truest to the book in terms of adaptation in my opinion, more so in part 2 than in part 1. There is a radical shift when comparing part 1 to part 2, and you can see a kind of clear arc there, which is great to see. So I could talk about Rebecca Ferguson's portrayal as Jessica for hours, but that moment when Paul convinces the Fremen that he's the Lisan al Ghaib, and Rebecca gives that devilish grin, that is exactly what I was looking for from Jessica as the Reverend Mother. Fantastic performance. The only downside to the portrayal of Reverend Mothers in Dune Part 2 is that Jessica is not the only Reverend Mother. The fact that there's more than one Reverend Mother on Arrakis in Dune Part 2 kind of diminished Jessica's importance among them, which I didn't care for very much. In the books, she was the sole Reverend Mother of Arrakis, and that's why she is so significant. THE Sayyidina. THE Reverend Mother. With the use of the voice and emissaries, it could have been easy to portray a widespread control of the Fremen population through her influence without other Reverend Mothers being involved and added to the mix. But wow, those Stargate suits look so good. And this Egyptian inspired aesthetic is definitely reminiscent of sarcophagi, which is actually a brilliant touch, because it reflects the roots of the Fremen, which are linked to Egypt. In the book, the Fremen call themselves the people of Misr, which is the Arabic word for Egypt. The Bene Gesserit too have links to Egypt in their study of the Azhar book, Azhar being the Islamic university in Egypt. The Azhar book is essentially the Quran, but what the Bene Gesserit have done in their role on Arrakis is select the pharaonic element of ancient Egypt the pharaoh being an oppressor in the religious or biblical sense, in the Abrahamic faiths, and applies that aesthetic, and perhaps even that method of control, to the reverend mother role among the Fremen. Jessica having more of a prominent role in Dune Part 2 is actually not from the book, she takes more of a back seat, while Paul assumes power, but there's a time gap in the book, 
and in that three year period, you can almost imagine that's exactly what Jessica is doing behind the scenes in that time period. And those kind of things are what I enjoyed most about both adaptations. The things that didn't occur in the book, but that have so much basis in the Dune books. And in terms of the Jessica changes, dare I say I think it's an even better change in terms of adaptation than Paul's changes in the film. Who else was a standout performance for me? Well, an honourable mention for the role of Lanville, played by Roger Ewan. I just knew he was going to die in the arena, but every fibre of my being didn't want him to die. I love how the infrared made the iris of his eyes look almost hawk-like, tiny dots eyeing fade like prey. Despite being a slave in the arena, it was very primal, very animalistic, heartbreaking what happened to him, even though you know it's coming if you've read the book. A fantastic performance by Roger Ewan, even though we didn't get much of him. But I like that they kept this Atreides lieutenant thread from the first part and brought it into the second. But Fade Ralther? Brilliant stuff by Austin Butler. And it was surprising to me because I didn't think that Austin Butler's Fade was going to be that much of an impact in terms of a screen presence in Dune Part 2 or as a performance in general, but he did a great job. I found Austin Butler to resemble Christian Bale's Batman more than Stellan Skarsgård's Baron in parts. You humiliated our family. You humiliated me. Swear to me! But I do love the fact that Austin tried to mimic Stellan's Baron voice to reflect that Fade grew up around the Baron and probably looked up to him. I loved the stuff he did in the arena. One of my favourite scenes is actually the arena fight. Getting to see the Harkonnen world brilliant. And the use of the black sun to portray black and white in the film, I really enjoyed. But there was an opportunity to show black splatters mimicking blood, similar to Denis's work in Polytechnique, and I feel it was a missed opportunity because there is no blood in the arena, making it a bloodless gladiatorial fight. But perhaps those black splatters would have caused the film rating to increase. And finally, the other standout performance, Paul, played by Timothy Chalamet, who really dialed up Paul's character all the way with the performance, showing that he can not only command the Fremen, but can command a set as well. His imposing presence definitely showed that by the end of the film, Paul is no longer merely a boy, but a man with power in his grasp. The changes made to his character, fitting much more into Paul from Dune Messiah rather than Paul from the second half of the Dune book, clearly shows the intent of Denis Villeneuve to want to make a third film. In Dune Messiah, Paul will rule with an iron fist, whether he likes it or not. I loved the imagery of inside the Emperor's ship, when Paul enters the throne room with this giant cross of light imposing upon them all, and it felt like the coming of a Christ-like figure, a messiah, or more accurately, an antichrist-like figure. I mean, I absolutely love imagery like this, and it reminded me, for some reason, of the Omen poster with that shadow of the cross, and I'm sure there are other examples in cinema of light crosses but I first thought of this poster, which is what the imagery reminded me of. Probably because of the links between messianic figures, the end of the world, judgement day and things like that. And this Abrahamic eschatology, more specifically the Islamic eschatology, is what the Dune story borrows from. In terms of my issues with the film, I have quite a few. Go no, on, I have Neil. some issues. You don't generally criticize science no, fiction it's films, couple of do issues. You? It's important to note that they don't come from a place of hate. I greatly admire and respect these filmmakers immensely. It comes more from a love of the books and the source material, and really an understanding of the customs and cultures used by Frank Herbert in his world building, something I'll be exploring a lot more on this channel. I think there are some things that didn't need to be included in the film, and some things that they probably should have included. Taking the whole film into consideration, I'm not sure that it was necessary to reveal Paul and Jessica's Harkonnen lineage, unless they plan on touching upon that later in some way, but I'm not sure that they will. And I think it's precious screen time that could have been used elsewhere, because a lot of things were cut from the movie. From a book perspective, we had no navigators, we had no baby Leto, we had no knife-wielding Alia, no Thufir Hawat, no significance of the Nazoni scarf, 
just thrown in there to lure fans of the book into the belief that this is being faithfully adapted, perhaps? I don't know. We don't know why Faith's teeth were ever black. It was never explained. The answer has to be more than because it looks cool and scary. There's no explanation as to why his teeth are black, so I stand by the theory that he beautified his teeth for the Baron, similar to how Fade's harpies had black teeth. I think the film was more cynical towards Faith itself than perhaps even Frank Herbert intended, and I'm sure there will be tons of discourse on those themes from the film. I'll certainly be looking into that in the future. I think most of my criticism would be in how they handled the Fremen elements, Charney, Stilgar, the Fremen Divide, etc. I didn't care much for that. Part of the allure of the Fremen was their united front, although I understand all of the changes made. Perhaps there were changes that didn't have to be made if other elements were excluded or included. Stilgar becomes the comic relief of Dune Parts 2 with several humorous moments, perhaps one too many. Along with anyone religious, they are seen as silly and foolish by those who don't believe, but it's strange how those Fremen in the film follow Stilgar regardless. Isn't his faith a sign of weakness to them? But strict Fremen rules from the book are all out the window, including water discipline, the whole reason Fremen are resilient, formidable warriors in the first place, and the ultimate desert survivalists. I remember watching the scene with Stilgar, where he goes, the Mahdi is so humble that he won't admit he's the Mahdi. And at first I laughed with the audience in the cinema, because I did find it genuinely amusing. And in a way the scene is almost genius because it says something very dark but with humour. It says that no matter what Paul Atreides does, the Fremen are going to believe in him regardless, because he ticks most of the boxes about the Lisan al Ghaib, the Mahdi, etc. And even though there was mention of the Mahdi, there was never mention of Zen Sunni. Imagine that concept being out there in the public eye, exposed to millions of people. I think it would have opened a lot of interesting conversations up. I thought that one of the reasons why Javier Bardem was cast as Stilgar was because of the Spanish link of the Fremen word Cialago, which are the bats of Arrakis that pass on messages. I was hoping that these little blood drinkers would finally be portrayed on screen. Of course they weren't. A little scene that could have said so much in a matter of seconds. I think there's still room for criticism about how much Stilgar was portrayed as the comic relief in the movie. I personally saw Stilgar as the prime example of the Fremen, the ultimate warrior, someone to look up to, a leader almost as charismatic as Paul. Which isn't to say that he cannot be humorous and have a laugh, but perhaps he leaned more in that direction than I thought he would. Paul's obsession with Jameis is a strange choice but adds to the continuity of the choice in Dune Part 1 to make him a hypothetical dream friend, in a possible future, a reality in which Paul didn't have to kill Jameis. But the truth is, Jameis was a hot-headed, short-tempered Fremen, a weakness Stilgar always knew he had. It was called the Sarfa, the turning away, turning away from reason perhaps. But I understand the film's choice and the change even if I may not agree with it. The man who plays Jameis did a fantastic job. Let's talk about Shishakli, Charney's bestie. I initially thought, okay, they're going to give you a character that nobody cares about and make you care about them. And that's pretty much what they do. So Hela gives an authentic, honest performance as Shishakli. And she was handpicked by Denis Villeneuve himself. The actress didn't have to audition for Dune Part 2. Denis Villeneuve chose her specifically for the role. But what confused me was she didn't do the one thing that the character does in the book, which is give Paul the maker hooks to ride the sandworm for the first time. I know how much this role meant to Sohele Akub, and I'm really happy that she was chosen for the part. But she could have played Hara, for example, who was James's wife, even if they didn't want to include Paul's inheritance elements from the book. This would have made Paul's visions of James be more creepy and strange. Or she could have simply been a unique character without the need to gender swap a minute character. So Shishakli, this Fremen character, doesn't even do the one thing he does in the book, giving Paul his maker hooks. And I suspect the giving of the maker hooks scene was filmed, but cut. And I suspect that happened in quite a few instances too. And I feel that this pointless gender change ascribed to a small character from the book seems to have been used as Alia baiting in the Dune 2 posters. I've lost count the amount of times people have asked me about the girl in the poster who everyone thought was Alia. And sadly, I have to say, I only think she was placed on the poster to avoid accusations of a lack of men representation in Dune, which I find to be an insincere thing to do. 
But Soheila Yaqub does a great job at the Fremen language and giving a sense of authenticity to the Fremen. Moving on to the legends in this movie, I didn't like the way they used the word Sihaya in the film for Chani, and the strange myth about it among the Fremen. This wasn't in the books at all, and the fact she mixed her tears with the water of life simply made no sense to me. It almost meant that she was a believer, kind of backtracking on her anti-religious stance. You could argue that she was willing to do anything to save Paul, but it didn't seem like desperation, it seemed like conviction of faith, and a conviction in belief of that Sihaya legend. So some of the script was well written, but I think it also fell short in other ways. It's such a strange film to review, it's almost like two polarising opposite opinions are in fact both right, in a weird way. It's similar to how people react to the book, which I find pretty fascinating. Perhaps in that way, Denis captured the first Dune book well. I've seen people make these deep theoretical posts and comments about how genius an idea is in the movie, but I think the genius is coming from the writers of those posts themselves, and the expansive encompassing world of Frank Herbert. Not necessarily the film, or what the film intended honestly. I think a lot of these theories are coincidental, but what the film does is generate those theories and discussions, and that's where the movie succeeds. Denis' cutting down of the passing of time allows him to get away with some relationship issues between Paul and Charney, where otherwise they would not have been, because more time and love between the two would have bonded them even further, allowing them to work through difficult decisions that Charney would not necessarily have agreed with initially. I think the changes create a more difficult problem to solve, a tougher time convincing the Fremen that he is their messiah, this task was left to Jessica, who puts all of her Bene Gesserit training skills to good use. There's been this myth floating around that the water of life is worm urine. It's actually the bile from the stomach of the sandworm, not urine. Aside from that, I'm glad they showed how the water of life was obtained. Although I wish the sandworm had more fight in it, I wanted it to feel like it was constricting her like a snake, but it was more of an affectionate wrapping around like a cat's tail. A small nitpick I know. I just wanted to feel more of a sense that this was a dangerous organism, not to be handled lightly. How they even obtain a baby worm is beyond me, but I think the scene missed an opportunity for a more Giga-esque moment. Dune Part 2 had the opportunity to introduce a Gollum Smeagol-like character in Alia, but I just knew Villeneuve's stripped-back bear approach meant that she wasn't going to feature much in the movie, and I tried to warn you in some of my earlier prediction videos, which you can check out, but they didn't make this Gollum-like character in Dune Part 2, so I cannot honestly say that Dune Part 2 is equivalent to or better than the Two Towers of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Equally, I wouldn't say that Part 2 is like The Empire Strikes Back, but I can agree with Nolan that it is The Empire Strikes Back of this generation, in the sense that it's a sequel with darker tones and themes. I wish there was more of a focus on the spice and how it affects the universe overall. We didn't get navigators, we didn't get Thufir scenes, we didn't get Count Hasimir Fenring, all of that was cut. But hopefully we'll get navigators in Dune Part 3 or Dune Messiah. I think after Paul took the Water of Life, the end of the movie was kind of streamlined, and I could have easily sat through another two hours of that movie. I think things occurred too fast, so I never felt that the movie was too long. There's so much more I can explore with you about this movie, and I think I will do so in the coming future. For some, the movie is perfect. For others, it's simply a good film, and a worthy successor to its predecessor, Dune Part 1. Villeneuve's best film, though? It is radically different from anything he's ever done before, and I don't know whether this film can take away that title from some of his previous work, but what I do know is we will be talking about this movie for years to come, I'm sure. As I said before, this is an epic movie, grand in size and scale, and definitely a movie you want to experience in the cinema. What did you think of Dune Part 2? Let me know in the comments. All opinions are welcome. Check out some of my other Dune content or some of my other popular culture videos here.